Okay, well, I came back from the holiday break with a cold, so I, hopefully I won't do too much sniffling, sneezing, coughing during this video. Um, just to recap, what we're studying here is the kingdom Protista, which is just kind of casually divided up into the plant-like protists and animal-like protists and fungus-like protists. And we've already studied the animal-like protists, the protozoa. We're going to study the fungus, or I'm sorry, the uh, plant-like protists that are the algae. But before we do that, we're going to take a look at the fungus-like protists, which are more animal-like than they are plant-like. Um, but Notice that they're fungi-like, they're not fungi. Um, even though a lot, of, a lot of the terminology that's used for them is very similar to what we use for the kingdom fungi, as you'll learn when we study kingdom fungi. Um, but first off, they're represented by these two groups, so they're just kind of casually divided up into these two groups. These are common names. When I say casually, I, I mean that these are not taxonomic names. Um, they're not a kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, or species, or domain, or anything like that. So we've got the slime molds and we've got the water molds. These are not considered true fungi, so don't be confused by the term mold. We usually use that term to describe true fungi, but these are not true fungi. However, they do share characteristics with true fungi, and that's what makes them fungus-like. So, like true fungi, fungus-like protists are absorptive heterotrophs. Just like us, they're heterotrophs. Just like animals in general, they're heterotrophs, which means they eat others. Troph means to feed. Hetero means others. So this feeding on others, heterotroph. But we ingest our food. We take our food inside our bodies and digest it and extract the nutrients. Whereas absorptive heterotrophs, like true fungi and these fungus-like protists, they digest things outside their cells, extracellularly, outside their cells, and then absorb the nutrients into the cells. And in the process, it breaks down whatever they're feeding on. So, for example, this slime mold is feeding on the wood here of this tree. So it's digesting the wood, breaking down the tree, and absorbing the nutrients, but it can't absorb all the nutrients. And so some of those nutrients are actually made available to other organisms that are in the same ecosystem or environment. So they are absorptive heterotrophs as opposed to ingestive heterotrophs like animals. And this is how they, they perform their ecological role as decomposers, just like true fungi. So both true fungi and these fungus-like protists, the slime molds and water molds, are decomposers. They help to break down organic material and make nutrients available to their ecosystems. So that's what makes them similar to true fungi, but what makes them different from true fungi? Well, unlike true fungi, fungus-like protists have centrioles, as do protozoa, the animal-like protists, as do animals. So this is what makes them, uh, this is why we're studying them kind of along with the animal-like protists, the protozoa. Um, and it's also what makes them somewhat animal-like as opposed to the plant-like protists, which are the algae. Unlike true fungi also, fungus-like protists are amoeba-like. The individual cells are like amoeba. And they have no cell walls. Now, there is an exception to that. The water molds actually do have cell walls. Um, but in general, the slime molds and water molds are more like amoeba, animal-like protists, like protozoa, than they are like the plant-like protists, the algae. And that's the point. And they're not like the true fungi for these two characteristics, along with the fact that many true fungi are multicellular and here in the slime molds neither the slime molds nor, nor the water molds are considered multicellular they can come into a uh, colonial state they can be colonial and as you'll see but they're not multicellular like some true fungi are the only true fungi that are not multicellular are the yeasts so again, the fungus-like protists are the slime molds and the water molds. We're going to begin by looking at the slime molds, and there are two different uh, phyla of slime molds. And you can see why they call them slime molds. If you look at this image, um, this, this slime mold is kind of goozing and, and flowing 
um, sliming off of this leaf or all over this leaf and, and off of the leaf. So the protestant characteristic of fungus like protists, in other words, the reason that they're classified in the kingdom protista, which again is kind of a catch-all uh, kingdom, whatever doesn't fit in the other kingdoms gets lumped into the kingdom protista. So the reason that the slime molds are in the kingdom protista is that their cells are amoeba-like. They have amoeboid cells, like this cell. If you'll recall looking at amoeba under the microscope in the lab, they, they are shapeshifters. They never look the same way twice. They move around um, with these locomotive structures known as uh, pseudopodia, false feet. And they uh, move by cytoplasmic streaming. They kind of flow from one place to another. So that's what they have in common with the protozoa, but they're classified as these fungus-like protists instead of protozoa. And what we're looking at here that, that's sliming all over this leaf is an aggregation of amoeboid cells. In other words, a colony, an aggregation. All the amoeboid cells like this one have come together to form this collective slime. Um, and again, that's, that's why we commonly refer to them as slime molds. However, they do have a fungus-like characteristic in that they form these reproductive structures, asexual reproductive structures known as sporangia, and they produce spores from sporangia, which is exactly the same thing that fungus, true fungi, does. So this is a fungus-like characteristic, the production of spores from sporangia, sporangia being spore-producing structures. So these are sporangia, <clears throat> and here's a, this, this drawing represents a spore that is germinating. So the spores that are produced from the sporangia, they can be, they, you know, they're very, very, very tiny. So they're almost like the size of particles of smoke. So they can be very easily carried off by the wind from one place to another. And that's how these uh, slime molds disperse. That's how they, they um, spread. Um, and when the spores germinate, what comes out of the spores is an amoeboid cell, an amoeba-like cell. Not an amoeba, but an amoeba-like cell. And so again, that's what makes them protozoan-like. And then the sporangia, producing spores from sporangia, is what makes them fungus-like. So they have characteristics of both prote protista from the kingdom protista and from the kingdom fungi. Um, so they're not classified in the kingdom fungi. They're just kind of lumped into the kingdom protista along with other uh, unicellular and colonial organisms that don't fit in the other kingdoms. So my apologies, but here's where things get a little tedious because we're looking at life cycle diagrams uh, to try to differentiate between the cellular slime molds. And on the next slide, we'll be looking at the acellular slime molds. And then on the third slide, we'll be looking at the uh, oomycetes, which are the water molds. Okay, so cellular slime molds are classified into the phylum Acraciomycota. And that last part of the word, mycota, is what you also see in um, names for true fungi. So that's confusing too. Uh, if you were to see this name, if you're familiar with how fun fungi are named, mycota refers to fungus. A, a, a scientist or a biologist that studies fungi is known as a mycologist. So whenever you see that myco, it refers to fungi. But again, these are not considered true fungi. They're classified in the kingdom protista. So if I can just very generally introduce the diagram here. On the left, we have asexual reproduction. And on the right, sexual reproduction. And as you can see here, the individual cells of slime molds will aggregate, come together into a colony. And then the colony will form fruiting bodies, which are the sporangia that I was uh, identified on the previous slide. So this is one sporangium, and it's producing spores. And those spores then germinate, and, uh, and amoeba-like cells uh, come out of those, those spores. And the cycle continues. <clears throat> so acrisiomycetes are known as cellular slime molds because when they aggregate, when they form these aggregate colonies, they remain as individual cells. In other words, there's a plasma membrane around each cell and those plasma membranes remain when they're aggregated together, which makes them different from the acellular slime molds, which we'll look at on the next slide. When they aggregate, 
they lose their plasma membranes and become one big giant supercell called a plasmodium. So when it says here in parentheses, not a multinucleated plasmodium, that's to differentiate these cellular slime molds from the acellular slime molds we'll be looking at on the next slide. So to emphasize that point, these cellular slime molds are con considered cellular because they are solitary cells most of the time in their life cycle. Um, they only aggregate and come together for asexual reproduction. So they aggregate, but when they aggregate, they're not a multinucleated plasmodium supercell, as we'll see in the acellular slime molds. And so when they, when they aggregate, they form a migrating colony that can be referred to as a slug. It's a kind, that's just a common name, um, but it's not a plasmodium. So again, to make sure that you know the difference between cellular slime molds and acellular slime molds. Acellular slime molds form pl a plasmodium, which unfortunately is the same name for the organism that causes malaria, which we also study in this in this same group, um, Protista. That's a sporozoan, if you'll recall, a spor sporozoan uh, protozoan called plasmodium is what causes the disease malaria. So don't confuse this plasmodium with that plasmodium. So they form this slug, this migrating colony, to asexually reproduce. They reproduce sexually under favorable conditions. When there's plenty of food available, they'll reproduce sexually. They reproduce asexually under unfavorable conditions, and that kind of makes sense um, because they're forming sporangia to produce spores, and those spores can blow away, far away from where they are. So where the, when the food runs out where they are, they reproduce in a way that allows them to disperse someplace where there might be more food. So to emphasize that point here in the diagram, this is the asexual part of the life cycle. When there's no food left, that's when they aggregate and become the slug and then produce sporangia and produce spores asexually from the sporangia and they germinate when they land someplace favorable they'll germinate and uh, amoeba like cells will come out but dispersal is a big reason for this asexual reproductive life cycle so that they can blow away to someplace far away where there is plenty of food so asexual spores can remain dormant and wait out uh, conditions that that would become favorable and they can also disperse. So dormancy is, is a uh, very often used strategy for a lot of organisms on the planet to, to uh, exist for a long time until conditions become favorable and then they can start to grow again. Um, but here again, dispersal is a big reason for, for forming spores in the first place. Something else interesting to note here is, is how they know when to aggregate. Um, you know, how do they know to all come together to form this slug? And it's because they secrete a chemical signal. They communicate by secreting a chemical signal. So when they start to sense that the food is running out or that the food has run out, the individual cells will secrete a signal molecule that other cells will uh, sense, in a sense, and they will then know to come together, to aggregate, to form the slug that then will asexually reproduce. And I just gave you what that signal is here, what, what uh, experimentation has shown that the signal is. This is this thing called cyclic AMP, CM, CAMP, which is a nucleic acid uh, related to, to ATP, if you'll recall. ATP, adenosine triphosphate, the energy currency of all cells. So cyclic AMP, CAMP, is, a, is adenosine monophosphate. And it's in a different form. It's, it's in a, a ring form. That's why they call it cyclical. But that's nothing you need to know. I just wanted to point out that that's what they have found the uh, signal molecule to be. And then the last thing to, to take a look at here is more closely at the sexual life cycle and, and the whole life cycle as a whole to differentiate it from the acellular slime molds on the next slide. The acrisiomycete life cycle is mostly haploid, 1N. Haploid meaning half the number of chromosomes. Uh, so, for example, humans have 46 chromosomes, half the number of chromosomes is 23, and that's what you find in the gametes, in sex cells, in sperm and egg um, of humans, they have 23 chromosomes. Uh, in, in cellular slime molds, 
uh, their gametes also have half the number of chromosomes, uh, but their whole life cycle is mostly haploid. Their whole life cycle, the cells have only about half, not about, have half the number of chromosomes. And therefore, they can produce gametes, uh, or, or they can become gametes. The, the cells can become gametes. They don't have to go any th through any kind of special process to reduce the number of chromosomes. The, and the process that I'm talking about is meiosis. That's how our cells produce gametes by the process of meiosis. And that's how the number of chromosomes in gametes gets to be half, is through the process of meiosis. But here, their whole life cycle just about is haploid, ha has half the number of chromosomes. So cells can simply become gametes. Those gametes then confuse. And notice that they look identical to each other. There's no difference between, you know, in us we have sperm and egg, and there's a huge difference in the size and the, and the uh, specialized structure of sperm and egg cells. But here there's no specialized difference between them, and they simply fuse and form a zygote. That zygote then is 2N, diploid, has the full number of chromosomes, but it's the only thing in the whole life cycle that is diploid. So most of their life cycle is haploid, so they're mostly haploid, which is different than we'll see on the next slide for the uh, acellular slime molds. Cells can only go from haploid to diploid through fertilization, gamete fusion. And that's true for any life cycle. Any life cycle diagram you will ever look at, that's a general rule that you want to remember. The only way you go from haploid to diploid is through fertilization, through the fusion of two haploid cells to produce a diploid cell. Two cells that have half the number of chromosomes have to come together to form a cell that has the full number of chromosomes. And that's what goes on in human fertilization also to form the zygote. So fertilization. And this is the only 2N, the only diploid in the whole life cycle diagram is what I'm trying to say there with the only 2N label. Just like cells can only go from haploid to diploid through fertilization, cells can only go from diploid to haploid, in other words, cells that have half the number of chromosomes, through the process of meiosis. And again, that is how um, we produce gametes. That's how we produce sex cells. But that's how they produce the individual cells that make up their entire life cycle, almost their entire life cycle. So. At once the zygote forms, that one cell, it immediately undergoes meiosis to produce haploid cells, and then those haploid cells can either participate in, in sexual reproduction or they can uh, participate in asexual, the ase asexual life uh, of the cellular slime mold. So that's how members of the phylum Acrisiomycota operate. Next time we'll, we'll take a look at the phylum Mixomycota, which are the acellular slime molds.